Hello and welcome to the IAA Mobility Visionary Club. Today's episode is all about charging and the future of charging infrastructure. Today we are talking about charging infrastructure. Electric vehicles are currently experiencing a massive uptake in Europe. The rise is expected to continue in the future. But that can only happen if the charging infrastructure is there. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. I'm really pleased to have such a great team of panelists joining us here in the studio, as well as remotely. Let me introduce them to you now. This is Michael Hayesh. Did I say it right? That's absolutely right. You're the CEO of Ionity. It's a high-powered charging station network that's facilitating long-distance travel across Europe. Very glad to have you. Welcome, Michael. Thank you very much for the invitation and the pleasure to be here. To my right, we have Andreas Alman. He is Vice President of Strategic Product Management Accessories at BMW. We're very happy to have BMW and you here, Andreas. Great to be here, Sarah. Up on the screen, I've got Maria Vasilaku. She's the founder of Vienna Solutions, advising cities on urban transformation. Also, Maria, we should point out, you're the former Deputy Mayor of Vienna. Quite the CV. We're very pleased to have you. Welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Happy to be here. Directly under Maria, we have Thomas Bjornsson. He's the head of e-mobility at Vattenfall, one of the leading European energy companies. Thomas, welcome. We're very glad to have you. Yeah, thanks. Good, good to be here, even though it's virtually. And we also have Marcus Hagenmeyer. He's joining us from Boston Consulting Group, where he is an associate director advising clients across the world on the future of mobility. Marcus, thanks for being here. Thank you, Sarah. Pleasure to be here. Guys, I want to start things off with an icebreaker. And virtual guys, you're in on this too. We're all doing this together. We're going to go around the room and say, in one sentence, I never would have expected it, but the thing I actually find most fascinating about e-mobility is, and just to mix this up, we're going to start with Marcus. I would say EV charging itself. I would have never spent a thought in thinking about the fueling experience because it's so quick. But I spent a lot of thought into what the future EV charging experience actually looks like. Hmm. Okay, interesting. Shall we go to you, Andreas? Absolutely. Well, if done right, charging is much better than fossil refueling, much better than going to the gas station. That is most fascinating about e-mobility. Okay, Maria, weigh in for us. What do you find most fascinating about e-mobility? Actually riding a soundless electrical motorcycle. Ooh, that sounds like a fun way to spend an afternoon. Thomas, how about you? What's most exciting to you? Yeah, I would never have expected how emotional the topic is, you know, how passionate normal drivers get when switching to electric, even though they have never cared about cars before in their lives. Oh, it's nice to see a convert to the cause. And finally, Michael, what about you? Well, what do I, you find most fascinating? Well, I would say it's the beauty of e-mobility being available nearly everywhere because uh, when it comes to electricity supply, it starts with the household plug. And the household plug is literally speaking everywhere. Mm. And it goes up for sure up to high power charging. And the most important thing I see coming from the last year is the tipping point happened during a pandemic mm. of e-mobility, at least in Europe. Oh, that's exciting. All right, well, lots to talk about here. I think that set us up really nicely to dive right in and talk about the trends we are seeing happening in the e-mobility market. And I'm going to open it up to you guys. What are your personal observations? And share it with the group. Marcus? Sure. Happy to start. So I think the last year, actually, um, we found a really high increase in the uh, new car sales of battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. Uh, we are in Europe around about 20% of new car sales already. Mm -hmm. And uh, we expect it to further increase uh, up to 50% uh, by 2025 and up to more than 75% by 2030. So there will be a massive EV car park coming up onto, on the roads and on the streets. Yeah. And all the drivers, the underlying drivers actually behind it are really pointing on green, yeah. be it regulations, be it costs. So there's a lot of, of uh, positive momentum in this market. And that drives the need for charging infrastructure as well. Yeah. So currently, we are around 400,000 charging points in public space in Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, based on the latest forecast we see, we think it will be 
necessary to, to increase this number of charging points to up to 2.7 million charging points in Europe by 2030. All right, it's an ambitious goal. What about the BMW side of this? What are you guys seeing in terms of demand for e-vehicles? Well, demand, demand is soaring. We see uh, customers uh, going electric very quickly. We've sold more than 100,000 battery electric vehicles last year. That was a doubling uh, the number of the year before, and we will double it again next year, this year, actually 2022, with full availability of iX and i4. Um, what we see when we talk to our customers is customers of electric vehicles are absolutely happy with uh, the purchase of the car. Once they've gone electric, they uh, rarely uh, think about going back uh, to the fossil fuel. Okay. M Michael, what about increase in charging procedures? Where are we? Well, I would say looking at the last year compared to the year before, um, as I mentioned before, during the pandemic already, or also, uh, we saw a factor four of charging events mm. happening. That means, com coming back to Marcus' figures, if the market is really going that quick up, the demand of charging infrastructure, be it on the long distance, be it in the cities, be it home and workplace charging, at the same time needs to host this demand, which means there's a huge demand for infrastructure deployment mm. in the years to come. All right, well, that brings us very nicely to Thomas. Is Vattenfall up for it? Can you handle the demand? Yeah, I think we see a similar kind of surge in uh, in the number of charging session and the demand for for uh, charging infrastructure. I um, I on an anecdotal level, I mean, I, I reflected on this this winter when I was actually up skiing in the in the Swedish mountains with my family, and I think almost one out of a th you know one in a th three cars were electric. And wow. then we're speaking about people that drive long distances up to the mountains. So. It's really going up, and I think we're we're starting to see a shift from a focus on this range anxiety. You know, will I find a charger when I drive long distances? Over to more of a sort of availability anxiety. You know, when I get there, because there will be sufficient infrastructure, but will it be occupied? Mm. Mm. That brings us to the city perspective, and, and Maria, perhaps you can give us a view on that. What are we seeing happening now in in cities and localities to address this issue? Well, I would say for cities, um, e-mobility is, um, is, a, is a phenomenon that goes far beyond uh, cars. Mm -hmm. So we have right now cities that um, have to uh, change their bike sharing schemes, just to give you an example, towards electrical bike sharing schemes. We have e-car sharing models that are currently switching to, well, conventional car sharing models that are currently switching to e-car sharing models. And then, of course, it's the charging points issue. So uh, if cities do not already dispose of uh, urban networks for charging points, they are amidst planning uh, to install ones. And I'm not talking about you know capital cities. This is clear, but it is now also small cities. Uh, practically every city is, con is actually planning something like this. Mm. That's encouraging because if we're going to drive somewhere in our electric vehicle, there needs to be charging when we get there or else we're going to be quite limited. When we look at limitations, are we likely to face a charging supply shortage in, in Europe? What, what are the opinions here? Well, what we do see is that the amount of electric cars is rising much more rapidly than the uh, available infrastructure. So we definitely need to step up uh, the creation of infrastructure. Uh, this is certainly uh, a task that is a joint task for, uh, for governments, for uh, auto industry, for mm. the energy sector, for specialized uh, uh, companies like Ionity. And we need to bring this up. This is um, an absolute necessity uh, to go forward with electric mobility. Yeah. BMW and Ionity are actually working together on this, right? Well, they are shareholders of Ionity uh, together with some, several others. But uh, coming from the infrastructure perspective, and again, the numbers uh, of the years to come from Marcus to say, um, like Vattenfall, like us, like all the other CPOs, we are preparing for this demand. Mm. But on the other side, we need to reflect that at the end, we need permissions to build up this infrastructure. Mm. We need grid connections. So there's a lead time for grid connections be it small ones, be, be it large ones, be it the ones more complex in the city, but also on the long distance, here you need to have the power available. And by looking at the demand, everybody is thinking of, hey, let's build bigger and quicker. 
mm. to really offer this availability for the customer. Yeah, And uh, that brings another at least challenge, not saying threat, but really a challenge to secure really the supply chain of the hardware because everybody now is running for the hardware. Mm. And so these three angles, meaning considering lead times for, permit, for permitting grid connections in combination with hardware, I think is the key momentum from the CPO perspective to say that we can, are ready to host this demand in our networks, mm -hmm. regardless if it's the Ionity network or the Vattenfall network or other networks. Yeah. I'd just like to add one point on yeah. the supply shortage. I think we need to de-average a bit. So it's not fair to say we are in general facing shortage. Mm -hmm. I think a couple of European countries actually do very well. And I'd really also like to hear Thomas' perspective. Um, I think the Nordics, for example, are yeah. quite well underway. Uh, I think we need to de-average by geography, um, but also by time. So I think there will definitely, and, and I fully agree with Andrea's point, so there will definitely be a, a kind of supply shortage during different phases of the year. Um, That's, that's very likely happening. Mm. And we need to think about it in advance, what to do. Um, on the other hand, I think it's also um, not a viable way to just deploy chargers everywhere and, and being, uh, let's say, largely underutilized mm. in some of the locations. So I oh. think it's, there's a balance. Yeah. I, I want to come back to this issue of what to do, but let's let's go to Thomas now and, and give us a brief overview of, of the Nordic perspective. What's the situation there? Yeah, I think the averaging is is a good word to to use there by Marcus. Um, you know, taking a step back also and seeing that in the this first phase of EV deployment, many of the users actually do have access to to um, a private driveway or or, or a private parking space, mm. which means that you tend to to charge your car when it's parked anyway. Uh, so, so from that perspective, it, 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 it does work. And I think we're seeing that in the public space, in the cities, uh, the deployment is coming. Uh, for the long distance travel, as I said, you know, this winter traveling up to the, the Swedish mountains, it is possible and people are starting to make that plunge. Mm. Because it is a bit of a hassle to, to go, uh, but it, it, it is starting to work. I think what is important to to highlight there. I mean, hardware. I think is is a is a midterm uh, challenge to make sure that to to secure the supply chain. The grid capacity is something that that requires a bit of more serious consideration uh, because even though we may look at only the need from from an EV charging perspective, I think I've seen a recent study from the Euroelectric that states that only. I think it's only eight or nine percent of the total investments in in the grid in the city would come from uh, from uh, electric vehicles. Mm. The other ninety some percent is going to be from from other areas, yeah. which means that grid deployment really needs to be put in focus. Okay, grid deployment needs to be in focus. What can be done besides governments providing even more funding and incentives? What are the options? Well, I would say, if I may start, uh, one is about the as I said the permitting procedures for getting the permits, mm -hmm. right? Typically, when we are talking about having a new site of Ionity up and running, we are talking about six to eight months lead time, European average. Mm -hmm. Can be quicker, can be uh, longer, but that's the, the European average. And to speed that administrative process a little bit up would help to be quicker and quicker in deployment. The second thing is, at the end, everything starts with the location. So we need locations and sites and ground where we can start building this kind of infrastructure. Also, the governments, the city should think about where can we combine parking with charging, yeah? be it park and ride places, be it public ground that can be also partly transferred or refurbished into charging places that is a good way to go. Mm. And last but not least, as also um, uh, Thomas said, um, the grid connection. It's uh, really, it should be a priority also to get the approval of the different operators to say, look, um, you get a grid connection, yes or no, and the delivery time can be insured. These are three measures beyond incentivizing the infrastructure or the vehicles mm. um, that definitely would help. Okay. Mar Maria, do you want to weigh in with a, with a city perspective? And obviously we understand you can't speak for every city everywhere, but in a broad sense, why does it take so long to get these permits? I think, you know, from a city perspective, um, public space is a limited edition. And 
we have to accommodate for so many different uses of public space. Mm. Um, at the same time, we have different trends. So we have a trend towards pedestrianization. We need broader sidewalks, especially in historical cities. Then we have all types of infrastructure uh, on sidewalks predominantly. Um, so cities are reluctant to allocate public space to yet another additional use that, of course, will cost space. Mm. Um, clearly, we all know that you know, the switch towards electro, electric mobility means more or less also optimizing shared parking facilities. So it is about garages and it is about... Uh, large facilities and perhaps less about having a charging point every, I don't know, uh, so and so many meters in public space. But on the same, at the same time, we think, I, I think we need to create strategic charging point um, networks where we identify what might be strategic spots throughout the entire city um, that we will need to take as a starting point to create, once again, a network that will work. And then last but not least, we have several um, ideas of, let's say, shop owners, just to give you an example, that would want to create charging stations, charging points in front of their shop. Um, and currently, we end up with these places being empty. Mm. Uh, most times of the day, and then being used more or less as private parking facilities for the customers of the shop. So all this, of course, in the end means that cities may be sometimes reluctant um, in, in you know, giving permissions for charging points in public space. Yeah. Um, and the answer is, again, to, to go at it from a strategic point. You bring up an interesting point here, because let me play devil's advocate for a second. Mm -hmm. Don't we all just charge at home or at work? How, how much public charging infrastructure do we really need? Well, I would say we need at least two-thirds of the infrastructure being public. Why? Because, first of all, only 20, 30 percent of people are having really access to their home mm -hmm. and can install and also do it by themselves because it's their property. Mm -hmm. The rest is either rented space or workplace charging. And um, so, therefore, a huge amount of, of public spots needs to be established. But Picking up Maria's point, and we see good trend in all the different countries. The ones are a little bit ahead, the other ones a little bit behind, but bring the electric mobility and meaning the charging to places where you spend your regular time anyway, be it retailing, be it at grocery stores, be it at sports, leisure, wherever, cinemas, and having then the charge points there. Not necessarily always HPC charging, high power charging, mm -hmm. maybe 50 kilowatt, maybe AC charging is sufficient, but that's the key. That is really the key from the infrastructure perspective. And as I said in my, my, my intro statement, the beauty of e-mobility is you can bring it everywhere because it's so easy. Just, yeah, bring up a line and bring the plug there. I would like to weigh in from yeah, the customer perspective. Add... Thomas, we'll come to you, but let Andreas yeah. finish. From the customer perspective, charging is good when it is time synergetic. When you charge, basically, when you're doing what you're doing anyway and you charge on the go. You can achieve that by charging at home, you can achieve that by charging at your workplace, and you can achieve that when you are uh, having dinner at a restaurant, when you're shopping, and then, of course, uh, uh, charging speed needs to match this. I mean, it, I don't need a super fast charger at home because the car uh, will sit there uh, overnight anyway. Uh, I might not need a super fast charger in a place where I spend like two hours. It's not really cool to go back to the car after 20 minutes in order to free up the capacity. So infrastructure speed must be right, but charging should really be integrated seamlessly into the day uh, of the customer. Okay. I can, I can hear uh, the uh, utilization aspect. I mean, we are still in the ramp up of the whole e-mobility population of the cars on the roads. And uh, we do see that uh, the charge points that are in place right now uh, really ramp up their utilization. Maybe. Uh, you can say a bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just can't agree. Yeah, <laughs> because agree. it's it's really exactly that way. I think Thomas wanted to jump in. Let's go to Thomas quickly on this. Yeah, I I, I, I just wanted to react on on what you uh, now also uh, mentioned, Reyes. That that I mean, EV drivers typically want to follow the path of least resistance, and 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 the last the, the path of least resistance is typically when the car is parked anyway. And I think there's it, it's important to distinguish between in public charging, 
Mm -hmm. Public charging does not necessarily only mean high power charging. Right. This is an important component to it, and it will increase in importance as the uh, the, the penetration increases, as you get uh, a lot of EV drivers who, who really do not have access to their own driveway or their, their own parking spot. Uh, but there are great opportunities and great examples of this also already now where, uh, I mean, we are, for instance, operating one of the largest public networks in the city of Amsterdam and, and in, in, in other provinces in, in, in the Netherlands where we are working together with the city or other provinces to, to roll out large on-street charging, um, which is typically much easier to integrate into the grid as well because you don't get these extreme peaks. You can actually balance. The car is parked and plugged in for a significantly longer period of time than you need to charge. And then you can all, all of a sudden optimize and then pick the, the lowest priced hours or the, the, the hours with high inflow of renewables, for instance. Let, let's come back to something that you raised earlier, this, this idea of managing peak charging demand. If everyone's driving to vacation or everyone's going to the Super Bowl game, everyone wants to charge, what are the options here? Well, to, yeah, if you like, I can, I can start with a, with a couple of thoughts that we also spend some time on. Um, I think one of the key things is technology, hmm. definitely, because you need to implement some kind of smart charging technology to distribute the demand. So if everyone, for example, drives home at a similar time of the day, not all the cars then parked at home have to be charged immediately. So you can also distribute the demand a bit more and say, um, due to smart charging on a, on a higher level, um, which car needs to be charged when and, 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 and forego this kind of peak demand. Mm. This is one thing. Um, the other thing I mentioned before, of course, is some kind of things like vacation, for example. Um, here, of course, smart charging won't help a lot. Yeah? So everyone is starting driving. So I think it's also in responsibility, maybe of all of us, um, to change our behavior a bit. Yeah? And this could, of course, also be publicly incentivized. The very simplest method is then pricing, for mm. example. If it's getting really, really expensive, I might think about if I really need to leave at the exact same date and time than all the others around me. Yeah? So this is, this is a second thing um, uh, that, that comes to my mind. And the third maybe would be around, of course, there will be also solutions like mobile chargers mm -hmm. that you deploy when peak demand comes and when it's needed. A um, couple of players are doing that already and testing that. And then they can be moved away again or to move to somewhere where, where, where charging need occurs again. Go ahead. Well, I would say the most obvious thing is build more and quicker charges mm. yeah, to really deploy the demand to different locations. Digitalization, absolutely key, because the customer needs to find the right spot in a peak demand, meaning Friday afternoon, holiday season, everybody's going south, north, east, west, wherever. But then the navigation system telling them, look, this one is already full, take the next one, mm. or charge five kilometers before, because the next one is already occupied, this kind of intelligence, I think, is the next step to really spread the demand based on the customer needs. At the end, we saw last year a lot of queuing events. We expect many of them this year again. But as I said, this is something that is a temporary effect which can be overcome. The battery storage on site, yes, might be a solution, but also from economies is something needs to be considered. At the end, when there are 20 cars standing after the 10th, 20th charging uh, event, maybe the battery is empty and it needs to be recharged as well. So might, so to say, relieve the pain a little bit, but at the end, a long-term solution looks different. I think there are a few may, things may at play I, that make this a bit easier. Yes, sorry, let's go to Maria and Maria, then we'll come to yeah, you. Yeah. yeah, Maria, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to add that, you know, from a grid perspective, of course, diversifying uh, charging infrastructure is good because it means then that not everybody will be charging at night, just to give you another example. Mm -hmm. And it gives us the opportunity to have people charging, um, you know, throughout the day, um, depending on whatever they plan to do as they go. But I wanted to also contribute the, the idea of what is actually the charging point of the future when it comes to travel. 
Because what we all right now have in mind are the old traditional gasoline stations. And I think that, you know, the, the station of the future will look very, very much different mm. uh, than that. It will be actually uh, a huge spot, most probably, with numerous charging points, right, where we will actually park all the way. Uh, along the way to our vacation, let's put it this way, and then use perhaps the quarter of an hour while we're doing charging uh, in order to do some shopping and so on and so forth. So I think that um, we need to also envis envisage, you know, what what these infrastructures will look like in, in future and that they will be very different to what we know today. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's get the manufacturer perspective on this because queuing yeah. event has got to strike a little bit of fear in your heart. What are you hearing from customers? What do they want when it comes to charging? Well, um, I would first uh, reiterate a bit what uh, we had said. Um, the intelligence in the car is already there, uh -huh. right? We have an intelligent route planning that works with real-time data on the occupancy of uh, charging uh, stations, that works with, uh, with projections and uh, 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 projections on the future uh, utilization and advises the driver to take the right route, okay. to really evade uh, the blockages that might occur at some point. So, that's so the intelligence there. is in the car, it's improving every day, it's, it's learning, the yeah. system is learning of course, and uh, that is certainly a good thing. Ranges of the electric cars have been increasing and will to some extent uh, increase further in the future, which means that uh, the skiing holiday you typically reach on a charge, you don't, you don't charge on the way, right? And um, uh, lastly, uh, I would like to stress one point. Uh, the electric cars and the, and the batteries in the car are not only a problem uh, for the grid, they are also part of the solution in a way because it is a big distributed uh, energy storage, right? We can, on the one hand, help smooth out demand by intelligent uh, steering of the charging process. We do that at BMW. We have 5,000. Uh, charging points on our premises for employee charging. Thousands of them are for the general public to use as well. And of course, there's load balancing uh, enables this kind of scale here. But we can go much further. We can balance and then we can at some point also give power back to the grid and really help smoothen demand and help uh, to bring forward uh, the energy transition to renewables. Mm. So it's not only part of the problem, also part of the solution. Some OEMs are operating or they've announced proprietary charging networks for their customers. Is that a solution for the future? Clear no. Why? Because we see it also from the ones starting very early, right? Opening now the networks. Uh, and at the end also is um, about really hosting the demand and, and spreading the demand. And if you invest this kind of money in such a huge numbers, at the end also, you have to evaluate it as a business model. Mm. So the sooner or the later, yeah. I would agree, Michael. I yeah. would say there might be some spots similar to, we all know the airline lounges, right? Yeah, different. there might be some spots where uh, certain OEMs invest on purpose to improve mm -hmm. the customer experience and say, this is a proprietary spot or a station for just for our customers. Mm -hmm. I think that would be, uh, but not the majority of the charging stations. It would be mm -hmm. uh, maybe here and there on, on, on some of the prime locations. Most of the network should be open to increase also utilization of the chargers. Yeah. We believe in open networks. Mm -hmm. And we also believe that based on an open network, we can create a premium customer experience. Mm -hmm. But the basis uh, should uh, be an open network because that is the best way to match demand and supply in terms of charging. Mm -hmm. When it's a fractal structure of uh, individual proprietary network, we, we need much more in terms of infrastructure to meet demand. I want to come back to something that Maria raised earlier, which I think is just a, a beautiful thing to talk about. Let's envision the charging station of the future. We're, mm -hmm. we're, we're looking into the future and we have an ideal world. What is the ideal charging experience? Well, may, uh, as Maria described already, um, looking at our use case on, in our HPC network, and uh, we shortly announced also our growth plan for the next years, which is about more than 1,000 sites and more than 7,000 charge points. And we also developed an own Ionity architecture, so to say, which starts with a small spot, just a roof over it, up to a 
we call it the OASIS concept, which is, so to say, charging 2.0. And it's exactly what Maria described. A huge spot with, with a huge of charges, but on the other side also a lot of attributes that gives additional customer experience. Be it food, be it other amenities, be it something. Think about just to relax a longer period of time, uh, doing some yoga, doing some really relaxing, doing some work on site. So a typical, so to say, highway site, but dedicated not only on refueling the vehicle or recharging the vehicle, but also think about recharge yourself on such a long mm -hmm. trip because it's not the destination you're looking at. It's really the next one you're up for, maybe the next two or three hours in the car. So the importance of recharge yourself or the family or the kids, mm. go a walk with a dog, I don't know what, yeah? Play some football, that's the station 2.0. That, that's such a beautiful vision, and I think it's so nice to think about. Instead of getting a, a crappy gas station coffee, you're going to do some yoga. How far is that from reality? Is this a pipe dream? Is this is this feasible? Where <laughs> where where are we? I, I hate to put your dream on the spot, yeah. but like, could we actually do this? I think there's a lot of uh, uh, visions and visions by companies uh, that that are working in this direction. I think uh, uh, some, let's say, first pilots you see already actually mm. um, in the, on, on our roads. Um, I think it's uh, still, of course, it, it requires some time to really implement also at scale, definitely. Uh, but I think that's the way to go. Yeah? Yeah. To put it in one sentence, I would say the ideal uh, charging experience is you don't go there because of charging. You go there because of other things. Mm. And then you are charging while, while really? you're doing other things. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, indeed, I, I, I think we, yes, we don't Maria. need to look at... Let's go to Maria and then Thomas. Okay. I love a panel where but everyone think... wants to talk. <laughs> but I think that this is a one-time opportunity for small cities along the way. Uh, so perhaps, you know, thinking about the future, it's not about a transformation of gasoline stations on highways, but it's more like planning the travel ahead and then leaving the highway, perhaps, and driving like two to three to five kilometers off the highway and then finding a spot where actually small cities can benefit uh, in terms of tourism, just to give you an idea. Mm. So combining the yoga and the restaurant and perhaps an overnight stay um, with once again um, economic development opportunities for, for smaller cities, uh, that could be a way to go about this. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. Thomas, how about you? Yeah, I think I, I think the, the the station of the future is is emerging already now. You know, we don't need to wait for something completely new to um, to pop up. Uh, I think the charging stations, depending on the use case, are there, and 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 the future is when they completely integrate into your daily activities. Hmm. So it, right. it connects to your weekly routines. You know, when you go shopping or when you go to work and when you go about your daily business, that is actually when you stop. And if it's for a for a five hour stop, or if it's for a one hour stop, or a thirty minute shop to stop to, to go shopping, that's actually when you're going to do it, and it's going to be much more seamless and convenient. Seamless. And I think also the point that, that that Maria raised on, you know what, take a one or two kilometer detour from the uh, from the highway, you'll actually experience a, a beautiful new scenery that 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 that, that you've never seen it, it it does open up opportunities for smaller cities or for uh, smaller restaurants that are are, are just by the, the highway mm. i'm hearing a lot of opportunity but let's talk about future business models will we see this tesla end to end approach exceed or do you think we're going to start to see specialists that focus on single activities within the charging system for example just providing access to different charging networks without actually operating them. Where do you guys see this going? Well, I would say it's a diverse world and uh, it's good with the new technology entering the market and even with the speed and scale we see as of today, there are so many opportunities also when it comes to business models. At the end, the customer will decide if the customer is happy, if the customer experience is great, then very likely also the business model will succeed. Mm -hmm. But having all these different approaches out there, charging in combination with marketing, um, I don't know what, yeah, roaming platforms, uh, many, many different things that make e-mobility ecosystem work is good to see, 
But at the end, we really need to consider what is necessary. And I would say the ones that can really convince the customer the best, they will survive. Mm. I think uh, from a customer perspective, uh, uh, seamlessness we have discussed. And uh, with BMW charging, you basically have access to 90% of the charging infrastructure that is there in Europe, right? Mm. And this is in a situation where you have 500 CPOs, where you have uh, integrated players on the one hand, where you have uh, an integrator like uh, uh, BMW Mini Charging. Uh, so there are roles uh, to fulfill. And uh, I believe we need to keep it simple for the customer because the customer uh, really wants a seamless, uh, no hassle experience. And we are there already uh, to a large extent. So we have gone a, uh, quite, a, uh, quite some steps in that way already. It's encouraging to see these first steps. Let's, let's talk for a second about whether electric vehicles can really contribute significantly to reaching net zero targets in our cities. And, and Maria, maybe we, we go to you for this one. What do, what do we know? How, how much of a contribution can these make? Well, they clearly are a great contribution, but uh, I think you have heard this one million times mm. already. Um, the, the great opportunity is that the switch towards e-mobility uh, also comes with a different driving behavior. Um, it comes with mobility as a service. It comes with uh, planning travel. It comes with demand responsive services. Uh, it's the switch away from, you know, the, the one person, one car uh, mobility type towards uh, shared mobility um, offers and multimodal mo mobility access points. And I think also this is why at, at this stage, mobility providers are, um, you know, the, the, the solution of the future. Mm. And also car manufacturers are taking the switch towards becoming mobility providers. Yeah. So actually, if you look at it in the end, it means that e-mobility is a huge opportunity. But once again, the huge opportunity is also because we will have a different driving behavior uh, that goes with it. Um, and um, this also means, of course, that uh, the grids will be able to, to cope with demand much better. Yeah, I think that, that brings us to Thomas quite nicely. Can the grids cope with these changes in driving behavior? Are you ready for what's coming? Yeah, I mean, you know, let's, let's not pretend that it's not a challenge. Of course, it, it, it will require some investments. But uh, I think, as I said in the beginning, the uh, electrification of cars will only uh, be about 8 or 9% of the total investment need. And, and what makes this one stand out really compared to other needs when it comes to urbanization, new uh, buildings, new uh, new industries, etc., is that this is really an area where the cars and the batteries can be part of the solution. I mm. think, and, and they already are to some extent. We are already, from, from Vattenfall's perspective, piloting this and doing it in, in a larger and larger scale in Germany, in Sweden, especially in the Netherlands, we, where we have been doing this at scale with, with thousands of charge points at the same time. So mm -hmm. it can definitely be done. You mentioned batteries being part of the solution, and I'd, I'd love to get you all to weigh in on what sort of new disruptive technologies are in the pipeline? What's coming for us? Give us a little glimpse into the future. Yeah, there's a couple of things um, that are currently um, also disrupting charging again. Mm. I mean, we can talk about, uh, of course, different battery technologies, uh, to put it that way. It also, the, the packaging in the vehicle. I think is that something uh, that's quite disruptive. So instead of putting a, a single block into the vehicle, you can integrate it into the frame and structure. And um, uh, very likely Andreas can talk even better about it. But I think it's, it's something that's a trend that also will help to optimize um, the amount of battery you need to put in the car. Mm. Because it's also that the weight you need to add to the car is something that, that plays an important role. And that helps you with that. But, but also like the size of the battery, um, you can easier integrate it into it. So there's a lot of, of course, also from chemistry point of view, developments in, in battery technology. And besides that, of course, we have things like uh, wireless charging. Mm. Um, I think it's still a bit out. Um, mm. It's the ultimate dream, I think, like the phones we know we put on the table and yeah. they, are charged, they are charged up. 
Um, there's even some, some fancy concepts of you are charging while you are driving. So you have like uh, the charging implemented into the road, but that also requires massive infrastructure mm -hmm. investments. So I think um, sticking today with, with the normal charging routine, I think is already challenge enough. Um, but there's definitely uh, interesting technologies out there. Yeah. Well, I agree. Um, I believe uh, really disruptive um, technology or dis disruptive ideas can come uh, with the combination of uh, some of the uh, things that are in place already. Electrification on the one hand, uh, uh, highly automated autonomous driving on the other hand. For instance, uh, we showed it at the IAA in Munich. Uh, you basically integrate charging into your day by just dropping off your car. The car automatically drives, finds a parking spot, is robot charged while it's parked there and maybe you even get, get it back like fully cleaned, right? So this kind of uh, service innovation, I believe there's a lot of uh, things to come. The cars are getting more and more efficient, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the battery on the one hand, but it's also the overall car that is improving efficiency. So that uh, adds up to range and also contributes to uh, CO2, of course. And um, other than that, I see a lot of incremental steps now uh, that we are making uh, uh, the electric cars and the whole ecosystem step by step better. Yeah. Well, couldn't couldn't agree more because I was thinking about e-mobility itself is a dis disruption. As we heard today, city perspective, grid perspective, CPO, manufacturer, consultants, whatever perspective, we are in the middle of this disruption. At the end, the small steps definitely come together. And for me, the key element is digitalization. Okay. Yeah, be it in the vehicle with the services, be it in the grid with the grid services, be it on the energy side, because we're talking about an energy business, at least coming from the CPO perspective. We are talking about how to integrate lots of renewables into these networks to really significantly decarbonize transport and reduce the individual carbon footprint, because all of us, we are individuals, and we are sitting individually in these vehicles and it's so important to decarbonize our footprints. So therefore also the European energy transition will play a significant role in the integration in this kind of systems, definitely. So for you, the key element is digitization. I'd Absolutely. like to do a quick Absolutely. round robin because we're, we're coming yes. to the end here. So let's let everyone weigh in on this. What is the key element for this? What's, what's the takeaway here, Andreas? I agree, digitalization will really bring the parts together and uh, increased efficiency is certainly uh, another aspect. And also integration, uh, car integrated into the networks, all of these pieces uh, basically brought together by digitalization, that is the way forward. That's two votes for digitalization. Maria, how about <laughs> you? Do you have a different view on this? Not really, but I would say increased efficiency is of course the key to the future and then perhaps also contactless charging. Mm. Thomas, how about you? Yeah, I think, I mean, taking the customer view, you need to make it easy, convenient and transparent, you know, wherever you charge. And, and there, of course, digitalization plays an important role. You don't need to yeah. care about anything what happens behind the plug. Uh, from the technology perspective, I think also there, I mean, when the car is charging, it is part of an energy system. So it needs to be optimized and, and, and made to work. Hmm. Marcus, last word to you. I agree with Thomas. I would have also said customer experience, supreme customer experience throughout the whole EV journey, starting from purchasing the vehicle until using and, and charging the vehicle until reusing it. Um, I think that's key to get it really right. Mm. Plus, I would say um, catering to the demands because they are different now. Uh, instead of fueling. So you also need to address these different demands from the different customers, be it private charging at home, charging in public. What do customers actually need? What do customers need and how to get it to them in time for this massive revolution that we're in the middle of. Guys, I can't think of a better place to stop this. Thank you so much, Michael, Andreas, Maria, Thomas, and Marcus. This was such an enlightening discussion. And if you also found it enlightening, I would encourage you to join us on our IAA Mobility Visionary Club social channels. We have plenty more content about the mobility revolution that's happening right now. See you there.